one of the al that we say on Yom Kippur is an al over the uh, over the Yetzirah. It's an alphabetical acrostic. So we have two olives, two base. When it comes to 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 the al for Yud, <coughs> it says al I mean, it doesn't make sense because what else are the sins about? What is the driving force for all the sins, if not the Yetzirah? So what am I clapping al hate for the Yetzahara? There's a famous story about um, a father who had a very talented boy uh, who was going off the derech, whatever that means, <clears throat> a wayward child, or we would say a kid at risk, today's lang- lingo. And so she brings him to the alt. Uh, so he goes to the altar Rebbe and says, I, I, I don't know what to do with this kid. So the altar Rebbe says, okay, so send him to me. Let me speak to him. Now he knew that that kid isn't going to want to go see no rabbi and certainly no Hasidish rabbi. <clears throat> so he had to devise a plan uh, to get him to Liozhna, where the altar Rebbe was holding court. Um, so he knew that the kid was addicted uh, to horse racing and very fast horses. It was one of his addictions. So he said, can you do me a favor? I need you to deliver a package uh, to Liozhna. And the kid knew that his father did not approve of him riding horses, racing horses. It was unrefined. In a wagon is fine. <laughs> But for a Jewish boy, horse racing was definitely not, and certainly the gambling that went along with it. <clears throat> okay, so he said, can you, so he says to, he says to his, um, his father, do you mind if I take my fare? Can I take my horse? I don't mind taking this to Liozhna, but can I take, so the father says, yeah, okay, take your horse. So he gets on his horse <clears throat> and he rides in to Lioshna. And the Alta Rebbe says, hi, how are you? Thank you for the package. And he said, what is, what is this? He said, oh, this is my horse. That's a very good horse. Yeah, what, tell me what's the advantage of this horse? He says, well, <clears throat> it's a racehorse. What's the advantage of a racehorse? It gets me to places very much quicker than a wagon. Uh Uh-huh. But what happens if you get lost? Well, if I get lost and I lose my way and I have to come back, I come back very quick. I go, I come back much quicker. He's so the Alter Rebbe said, that's if you realize that you lost your way. That's if you realized you lost your way and you're going in the wrong direction and you're on a racehorse. Well, yeah, if you know that you've lost your way and you have to come back, you'll come back very quickly. <clears throat> and, this, and the young man being um, a very wise young man understood that the horse wasn't the horse, <laughs> that, the, that his horse was his Yetzirah. And the, and the nimshal is a very interesting nimshal. In Hasidus, we say, al chait shechotonu lefonecho for the Yetzahara that you gave us. You gave us the Yetzahara. So the question is, what did we do with that Yetzahara? Did we misuse the Yetzahara or did we make use of that racehorse to come back quickly, to do the tshuva quickly? And that depends on the realization that I'm in the wrong path. And that's what the Alter Rebbe uh, got through to the kid. And he realized, oh, yeah, right. You have to realize that you made the wrong turn. Coming back quickly is just the vehicle, which introduces us to today's topic and the end of my series on <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, the the following Gemara. I 
I got it. Can you see it? Can you see the, the screen? So the, the Gemara in, in Yuma that I've been talking about for four weeks now, Ha'omer, someone who says, Echtev Ashuv, Echtev Ashuv, I will sin and I will do tshuva. I will sin and repent. I will sin and repent. Let's just look at the words that are used by the Gemara. Ain must speak in biyodo lasos tshuva. It's a very interesting and enigmatic statement. Must speak in his <clears throat> I won't get. I, he won't be given the opportunity to do tshuva, meaning it, it won't come his way. We have to. We have to dig into that. So the Gemara in Yuma says, if someone says, I will sin and Yom Kippur will mechaper, I don't have to worry about that because the day itself is mechaper. Ain't Yom Kippur in mechaper? No, no. And the, the Gemara continues, Dorosh Rabbi Elizabeth Azari, Mikol Chato Sechem Bifnei Hashem Titoru, on Yom Kippur in Leviticus 16, it says, on that day, Shabbat Shabbaton, Yom Kippur, I will purify you from all your sins. So now the, the Gemara qualifies all your sins. That only applies to sins between man and God. Yep, Yom Kippur Mechav. Avero Shbein Adam Lechavero, but an Avero between man and his neighbor. Ain Yom Kippur Mechav Be'atche Yirtze Chavero. You first got to make amends. First have to make amends. And, and without that, Yom Kippur will not be Mechav. Now comes this beautiful notion on the Rabbi Akiva. And before I do that, I want to play with you. I want to play for you, if I can. Um, the song by Lipa Schmelzer, and you'll hear the words and follow the words as you hear it, okay? Besides the um, clearly um, Spanish influence of the bullfight, uh, which, which is really crass, but Lipa Schmelzer is singing Omar Rabbi Akiva, and we do sing this, you know, Simchus Torah. Ashrechem Yisrael, and this is straight out of this Gemara. Lifnei mi atemetarim. That is, happy are you, Israel, before whom you are made pure. Umi metaher eschem. And who is purifying you? Avichem shebashamayim, your father in heaven. As it says in Ezekiel, I will pour upon you the, the purifying waters and you will become pure. And then this wonderful verse in Jeremiah 17, Mikve Yisrael Adonai. God is the mikveh of Am Yisrael. It's almost like we are dipping into the mikveh of the divine. That is the day of Yom Kippur. That is this Gemara uh, in, in Yuma. Happy are you, Israel, before whom you are made pure and who purifies you. There is no met better metaphor than the mikveh for God's role during our service, you may chuva the 10 days of repentance that lead up to Yom Kippur. And the word play at the heart of Rabbi Akiva's Midrash teaches us about the emotional and spiritual and physical changes that must occur for us to become pure. We have to 
conjure a sense of hopefulness. Ashrechem. <coughs> Ashrechem Yisrael. Happy are you. In order to undergo the personal transformation required to beginning a new year. So what is this metaphor of the mikveh Yisrael? And for that, we have to go darker, <laughs> as I always do. Um, and we have to look at a Rambam that tropes on this very theme. This is the source of the Rambam's um, uh, theme. And the Rambam says, and here is the Rambam in Hilchus Tshuva. Kol hamisvade bidvarim, people who, or anyone who confesses with a speech act, with a uh, a verbal confession, below Gomar Belibo, and did not complete in his heart, la azov, to forsake the sin. Now remember, Rambam has a number of, uh, <laughs> a rabbi told us yesterday, four conditions. Number fir The first one is yit yitnachem al she'ava, um, <clears throat> After I returned, Shuvi, Chuva, Nichamti, I regretted. That's his proof text, meaning the Chuva is addressing a fundamental underlying paradigm that allowed the very sin to happen in the first place. When you abandon it, there is a sense a regret. You're saying that this thing is no longer even an option for me. I see it for what it is, and I'm not just saying I hope I don't do it again, or I'm, I'm going to fight this, or I wish this act was okay. The act is no longer an opportunity because it doesn't make sense to me. That is yit nachem. I regret the past. Then comes lehit vadot besfatai. That's called vidui, confession with the lips. Uh, it is articulating the sin and making it real. i taking it out of myself and verbalizing it. I'm taking it out of my mind. It's no longer a mental process. It needs to be an acceptance of the reality, which is paradigmatic to me now in a way that avoids my previous fantasies. It can't be part of my mental fantasy. So we verbalize it to make it part of something outside me. And then comes this statement. Velo gomar belibo la'azov. What does that mean, la'azov? Letting go of the sins. So abandoning the sin must come first, even before regretting, because for tshuva to take place, there needs to be a paradigm shift. And this sin is no longer seen as a reality to me. Or as the rabbi said yesterday, um, not even... <clears throat> not even getting close to any trigger, right? Vayonos vayetia achutzo. Yosef is the tzaddik because he doesn't let the trigger get to him. He runs away when she comes on to him. He runs away from, from uh, the sin. That's yazov, right? It, it's no longer reality. It's no longer an option. You have to leave the scene of the crime if it ever comes back again. So he abandons his sins and removes them from his thoughts and resolves in his heart never to do them again. That's Ya'azov. The nature of Aziva is the letting go. Now, if he doesn't do that, then Hareze Dome Letovel Besheretz Biodo. Now, I asked. Um, Hershey, uh, so, uh, Salome, Hershey's wife, to, um, to show you a picture. I asked her to draw a cartoon of Hatovel Vesheritz Biodo. So you have a beautiful image of a Hasidic Shiyid. I want him to have Payas and he's sh stimming in the mikveh 
and he's ready before Yom Kippur. And can you see that amazing image she did for me, right? He's yoirate. He went down the steps into the mikveh to completely purify himself. The mikveh Yisroel. <laughs> and what can you see what he's holding here? He's holding a lizard, a sheretz. There are eight types of shrotsim in the Torah. I, I, I liked the idea of a rat. And I wanted her to, to make it struggling, you know, with her legs flying and the tail flying. But then I realized that if it's alive, it's not Matame. It's only a dead sheretz. So it had to be a limp, dead carcass of a sheretz. And there it is. He's the chassid shayit in the mikveh, the sheretz biyodo. It is the most amazing <clears throat> image that I can't get out of my head. And the Rambam is basing that idea. Hadome le toivel the sheretz He is he is he is basing that idea on the Gemara that we had learned. Dome le toivel the sheretz biyodo she'ain hatvila mo'eleslo. Why doesn't the tvila help? Ad she yashlich hasheret. Because you're holding the sheretz. The sheretz is the thing that makes you tome. And you're holding the sheretz in your hand. And you think that you can be toivel with the sheretz in your hand. That won't work. <clears throat> because he knows the immersion will be of no value until he casts away the creepy thing. But Tzorich lefrot et hachet. So azivas hachet then means, I have to first cast away the creepy thing before I go into the mikveh. Shenema ono chato ha'oma zev chato gadol v'yasu lehem When Moshe is praying to God, on the Cheta Egel, he's, he's, he's confessing to God the, ob, the it's obligatory to name the sin. Look at this, people have sinned a great sinner. They made themselves a, a hey, Hatag. You think God didn't know that? Moshe had to articulate the addiction to gold and the LOK Zahav. He had to articulate it for in in order for them to then lifrot to get rid of it. So, what is the nimshal? That's my question. What is the nimshal? And I I thought that was um, that I that I would share with you Matis Weinberg's beautiful uh, articulated statement. <clears throat> he abandons only he who abandons will receive the mercy the aziva ozev that's what the rambam is saying the din in vidui is 100% vidui. It doesn't make any difference to the vidui if you lie through your teeth from the beginning till the end because you'll make yourself unclean again because you never let go of the sin. So what was the point? It's an unbelievable insight into the nature of vidui and the nature of aziva. So Weinberg is separating the two. He's steiging in the Rambam. He's steiging in the difference between Aziva, which is letting go of the Sheretz. You don't want to let go. So you're saying, Vidui, you want to lie about everything else? I don't care, but what good is it to you? <laughs> good if you let go. You're really not embarrassed and you want to lie about it? Fine. You don't want to change your mind about having done that sin? Fine. You want to fake out that it's never going to be thought about again? Fine. What do I care? Did you let go? The only thing I need to hear is that you let go. You're not holding on to it. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> it hit me that what is the nature of the Sheretz? The Rambam is saying that you went to the mikveh. 
Where did I go to the mikvah? I don't understand. How did I go to the mikvah? The Rambam should say, this can be compared to someone who puts on a raincoat and goes into the mikvah without his raincoat. He's pretending to go to the mikvah while he doesn't immerse himself in the very water. He's wearing a raincoat. What kind of ridiculous metaphor is this? He went to the mikvah, but you know it won't help because he's holding a sheretz. The simple meaning, of course, is that the vidu is absolutely a mikvah. Ashrechem Yisrael, mi atomataher, mi matahelesem. God is mataher, you, like he, like you going into a mikvah, mataher, he's mataher, you, once you do your vidu. Because you didn't let go, that's the only thing holding you back. It's not holding you back because of a flaw in the vidu. It's holding you back because it's making you unclean again. So where did you ever let go of it so you should become tahor? That's the point. I thought that's just a brilliant, brilliant point. The Gemara that is that that he's troping off mm-hmm. is a Gemara in Tainis, Omar Rav Adabaral, Odav Shiyesh Biodo Aveiro. A person has an Aveiro. Umit Vade, Veeno Chosebo. And he, he confesses. The per, it's like a person who's holding the sheretz in his hand. Even better metaphor than the Rambam. Even though he goes to every mikveh in the world, lo also lo tvila. The tvila doesn't help. He's got a sheretz in his hand. Okay, Zrocco, the moment he lets go, then it works. Then it works. Okay. Now, the Rambam, going back to the Rambam, he draws an analogy between <clears throat> the unrepentant sinner who declares a verbal vidui to a toivil sheretz biodo, a person who seeks to obtain ritual purity by immersing in the mikveh while still holding on to the source of impurity. He refers here to the category of tuma called tuma sheretz. I'll just show you my jastro, the apikoiris. Thank you, my friend. Let's define a sheretz, creepy crawly, as we learn in school. <laughs> he refers to the category of tumas called tumas sheretz. There are different types of tumor. He could have chosen other types of tumor. There's tumas nita, there's the, which one contracts through direct contact with the remains of one of the eight rodents lifted, listed in Vayikra 11. A person divests himself of the status of impurity through immersion in the mikveh, but it's ineffective if the individual continues holding on to the carcass. And so the metaphor that the Rambam in his dazzling interpretation of the Gemara in Tainus is that a person who wishes to erase a past sin cannot hope to do so unless he tashlichet <laughs> Sheretz, he has to cast away the rodent, meaning to sincerely repent. Misvade belibo, he got to bring the heart into it. If he goes through the motions of declaring the confession, the vidui, without undergoing the process of teshuva, the confession is as valueless as immersion in the mikveh holding a sheretz. Very nice. Now, this analogy has to be understood in our first reference to Rabbi Akiva's famous exclamation. Fortunate Ashrechem Yisrael, before whom are you purified? Rabbi Akiva establishes a kind of correspondence between the process of tshuva and the mikveh. Just like the immersion in a mikveh is effective to remove the status of tumor, so does the process of tshuva 
returning to the Almighty, remove one's status as a sinner. It cleanses the individual like the mikveh eliminates the status, the status of ritual impurity. And that really underscores the transformative nature of the Tuma experience <clears throat> and the tshuva experience. The process of tshuva entails not merely a change of conduct, but a change in one character and very essence. The occurrence of sin affects an individual's personal status that must be restored to its initial condition through the experience of tshuva. And in <clears throat> Hilchus Tshuva 7.6, he says, included in the ways of Tshuva is that the penitent sinner constantly cries before God with weeping and supplication. He performs charity and distances himself, Aziva, from the very matter which he sinned. As if to say, and now I quote the Rambam, I am somebody else. I am not that person who committed those acts. I am not that person. The objective of tshuva then is reaching the point where can, one can honestly avow, I'm someone else. I'm not the person who connected, committed those acts. Now, a number of later commenters, commentators have a problem with this rumba, and I want to just show you <clears throat> a couple just to put before you for consideration. Is this analogy an accurate one, as we asked before? From a strict halachic standpoint, the two cases, the sinner who repents without resolving to improve, and a person who immerses in a mikveh holding a sheret are not comparable. When a person contracts tumas sherets and then immerses in a mikveh while holding the carcass, actually the immersion is in effect effective in his eliminating the source of impurity. However, as he still maintains direct contact with the source, he immediately reassumes that status upon emerging from the mikveh. So if he's holding on to the mikveh, onto the sherets, and he's in the mikveh, that is actually quite effective. But it's only when he leaves the mikveh still holding the sherets that he now reintroduces the tumor. Technically speaking, and Alan will just love the technicalities, the, the presence of the sherets does not undermine the validity of the mikveh, rather reintroduces tumor the moment he comes out of the mikveh. This is a real deal, okay? In this sense, it appears that the case of immersions differs significantly from the situation uh, used as an analogy by the Rambam in the verbal confession. The Rambam speaks here of a person who confesses, but has not resolved in his heart to abandon, has not resolved in his heart. It's just merely a verbal um, declaration of his misconduct. And in a number of earlier passages in Hilchas Tshuva, he, he deems Azivas Hachet as an integral part of the Tshuva process, as we reviewed. I will never repeat this act. And in his definition of the essential component of Tshuva, he writes, and what is Tshuva? That the sinner abandons his sin, Azivas Hachet, and removes it from his thoughts and resigns in his heart never to commit again. So the resolve never to repeat the offense is an inseparable part of the tshuva, even of the verbal confession. So then what is the precise analogy? Toivel Besheret's Biodo and an insincere confession. In the former case, the insincere confession, the procedure is altogether meaningless. No purpose is served by declaring a confession without the heart, without the desire, commitment to improve. Going into a mikveh holding a sheretz by contrast, the procedure is indeed effective in removing the tumor, but that status is immediately reinstated when he comes out due to the continued presence of the catalyst. 
And so this subtle distinction between the halachic tumor of the sheretz, I'm not just trying to bring you a brisker diuk. It gives rise to the question of whether Maimonides intended to present this comparison as a precise nimshal, and you know me, I love that space between the moshal and the nimshal, and when they don't con- correlate exactly one-to-one, one, something is happening. Does he make this comparison to underscore the ineffectiveness of the insincere confession? And so we need to not account for the precise features of the two procedures. It was just a nice metaphor. It's a nice thought. Or did he see teshuva and immersion as closely related and corresponding processes compelling us to steig in why did he give us a nimshal that did not fit the marshal? That's the question. Is there a value in an insincere confession? That's what he may be pointing us to in that gap between the two, between the Moshal and the Nimshal. Now, in the anonymous Yad Haktana, a commentary to the Mishnah Torah, we find a startling suggestion. And he's the only one of the, all the commentators on the Ramba, and that's why I love it, that Maimonides, in fact, is acknowledging some value in a verbal confession not accompanied by resolve for future improvement. The Yad HaKtana claims that the Torah establishes the concept of vidui as one component of the tshuva process, but appreciates the emotional difficulty in character change. <clears throat> what a psychological insight. Those who are addicted to things in this world find it very hard to change. Does that make all the al valueless? Does it make the whole tshuva process of Yom Kippur waste of time? Many sinners truly and genuinely wish to repent. In every sense implied by this term, they are repulsed by their own shortcomings and long for the day when they can discontinue along the path of sin and begin a new chapter of full Torah observance. But however, now in this moment in time, They are overpowered by internal, external, neurological, psychological, genetical, epigenetical pressures that impel them to repeatedly commit the given act of sin and prevent them from achieving self-improvement. The Torah, which addresses itself to imperfect mortals and recognizes their failings and weaknesses, then establishes a means whereby even sinners of this kind can take one important step towards complete tshuva. Uh, the vidui then, according to the Yad Haktana, is a worthwhile experience even for a sinner, even as he is as yet in a capable of sincerely committing himself to never repeating the wrongful act. And then Maimonides' analogy is indeed an accurate one for the Yad Ktana. The sin who, sinner who confesses without a commitment to improve is indeed comparable to a toivel b'sheretz biyodoi, in that he too has performed a meaningful act of purification. He went into the mikveh. Of course, like the individual who immerses whilst holding a sheretz, he, he needs to, when he comes out and he's still holding on to it, he's got to go back in. He's got to repeat the procedure after casting away the rodent in order to achieve the desire. But just the toivel v'sheretz biodo achieves momentary purification despite the presence of the sheretz. And so too the sinner described here by Maimonides has performed some small measure of tshuva. Now, most of the others disagree with the yaktana. And I want to just bring you Yosef Kapach, the greatest interpreter in our generation from Yemen, 
of the Rambam in his commentary to the Mishnah Torah, he suggests a different explanation to explain the correspondence drawn between the insincere confession and the Toivel Sheretz Biyata, which he realizes is not a good analogy. He says the two situations differ from one another in that confession without a commitment to improve is entirely ineffective, whereas immersing while holding a sheritz momentarily is effective. Rav Kapach claims the comparison between the two cases lies in the emergence of Tuma Chadasha. Wow, absolutely dazzling. When you're in the mikveh, you're good. You are good to go. But when you come out of the mikveh, it's not that you've returned back to the old sherets. You are now completely uh, clean. And as you emerge and the sherets is in your hand, there is a tumah dasha, a new status of impurity as a result of the intended procedure. It's just brilliant. You went in to the mikveh to tovel yourself from all your addictions. In that mikveh, momentarily, you are free, my friend. As you come out, the coming out, having had that experience, brings you to a new Tumah In the case of immersion, of course, the immediately after the individual divests himself of his Tumah, a new state of impurity descends on him as a result of his ongoing contact with the Sheretz. It's like, it's not that I just have an addiction, I have a Yetzirah. If I'm trying to do something with that Yetzirah and I've gone through the process, I've gone through the Yom Kippur and now I come out, there's a change in the very Yetzirah itself. It's a Tumur Chadasha. Similarly, a sinner who confesses without resolving to improve has not only failed to achieve atonement for his wrongdoings, but has also committed an additional offense in abusing the precious asset of the vidui. He has abused the tool of the mikveh. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. And so I want to just add my, my little knech, because I've been struggling with you for the last few weeks about echter v'oshu v'oshu v'echter. And I want to... I want to bring it a kind of, um, I just want to bring some, <clears throat> charity to it. And I want to say that for me, the things that impede me from my tshuva process, most of all, the sherets that I go into the mikveh with that impede my ability to completely confront my past and completely engage in the tshuva process has to be uh, my resentments. Resentments build over the years and they are little like furry animals that we take out every morning to stroke. And they pollute the heart. They pollute the heart. And the hardest thing that impedes me in terms of my relationship with the divine and my relationship with my loved ones and with my, the people outside me, the sherets that I continuously struggle to let go of in that mikveh um, is very much the, uh, the resentments of the heart. And so I leave you with this wonderful uh, image <laughs> and um, hope that we all uh, share with each other this some um, and, and bring, you know, some charity to oneself and forgive oneself and not just um, not just be hard on ourselves as we go through the tshuva process. Remember that the, 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 the most critical al is al that, that that my biggest hate is that I didn't 
transform the Yetzirah and the resentments and the sherets that I, 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 I can't let go of. There is, um, Alan introduced me to uh, um, one of the recovery um, metaphors, which I, I just absolutely love. There is a, a neurobiology experiment where they, where they have a monkey in a cage and then they offer him a banana. And so he puts his hand through the cage and grabs the banana, uh, but he can't get it back in the cage because it's transfer and he hasn't got that understanding that you just have to turn 90 degrees and you can get the banana back into the cage. And so he doesn't let go. He will starve rather than let go of that banana. And I think that that's the sheriffs for me. We, we, we have to let go. And that's part of the tshuva process. And I bless everyone to be able to examine themselves this Yom Kippur, like our little Hasidish Yid with his payas in the mikvah. And that I bless everyone to let go of their own sheriffs. Have a wonderful, wonderful time. Yom Kippur is a time of happiness because we're promised that we will all be forgiven. Thank you, Papa. Beautiful. Ma Hasimotobu.